All right, so you've officially been hired as a learning assistant at Vanderbilt. This is amazing. Now you get to share your passion for the sciences with more students here at Vandy. You feel excited, hopeful, and nervous. The task at hand is no easy one. You've got STEM knowledge, and you're provided with the necessary tools and content to pass that STEM knowledge on. Yet, a science course requires you as an instructor to understand so much more than just the content you are teaching. We want to ensure that every student in our course is set up for maximum success. This is why we spent time in my pedagogy course talking about exactly how to motivate students to learn and how to make our classrooms a safe and inclusive environment. All right, and now we move to Zoom because that's what's easiest to record a presentation on. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen. So let's get started um, talking about forming an inclusive classroom and motivating your students. Now we'll be talking about forming an inclusive classroom first. And um, before I continue to the next slide, I would just like to talk about the three overarching topics that define uh, an inclusive classroom and how us as instructors can uh, facilitate the formation of that. So when it comes to forming this inclusive classroom, there are three things that uh, we must focus on. Number one is being critical of our own pedagogical instincts and internal biases and changing those to better fit our classroom. Number two, uh, highlighting the scientific achievements of groups that are underrepresented in STEM. And three, uh, taking into account how students may have different motivations and aspirations for taking this specific STEM course. So let's look a little bit closely at our first point. Forming an inclusive classroom, we must be critical of our own pedagogical instincts and how those instincts may be affected by our own experiences, identities, and privilege. So our classes are already naturally pretty diverse environments. And so it is wrong for us to assume that every single student uh, will work well with the class format um, and the way that we might like things to go as instructors. And so a good way to determine how we can best service our students is to uh, gather data via student surveys so that we can determine scheduling things like office hours uh, and the method of turning in assignments. Surveys like this make sure that everyone in the class uh, can submit assignments online. And if they can't, uh, we can form alternative options to better fit those students. Another example might be um, if the majority of students live on campus or off campus to figure out the best place and time to hold office hours or whether or not the majority of your students work so that you can adjust the workload that you assign in class. Another extremely important thing for us instructors to focus on is identifying our implicit biases and fixing those so that we do not come into our classroom with any preconceived notions about any of the students based on things like um, race, gender identity, etc. Um, a good way to identify your implicit biases and fix them is there's actually a Harvard implicit bias test, which I've linked right here. Let's see if I can click on it. Here we go. Um, yeah. Harvard's project aim plus it, you can take um, multiple exams that will help you identify, you know, your possible implicit biases to fix those, which I, I've taken a, a couple of these. I, I highly recommend them. We have ones that focus on gender and career, race, sexuality, gender science, all of that good stuff. So it's a great resource. The second important topic to focus on uh, when it comes to forming an inclusive classroom, specifically in STEM, is to highlight the scientific achievements of groups that are underrepresented in STEM. Now, um, women, uh, African Americans, Latinos, these are all um, underrepresented groups in the STEM field now. Now, as we know, STEM is currently dominated by uh, white males um, in our current society. So therefore, it is extremely important to continuously highlight scientific achievements of not just the old white men in our science textbooks, 
but also the achievements of underrepresented groups. Uh, I've listed some examples uh, below. I speak from a personal standpoint. Sometimes it is hard to feel motivated and feel like you can really succeed whenever there's nobody that looks like you or shares your same cultural background in the field to look up to. So these some wonderful scientists that made some outstanding achievements in science. Mae Jemison is a African-American woman. She is a engineer and physician um, and a former NASA astronaut. She's actually the first black woman to travel into space. Alan Emtage, uh, our Barbadian computer scientist, actually created what is now considered the world's first internet search engine. Antonia Novello is a Puerto Rican physician and public health administrator who actually served as the 14th Surgeon General of the United States. She was actually, she was the first woman um, and the first Hispanic to serve as the Surgeon General. Rosalind Franklin, we know her quite well. She is a, a white woman who helped us understand the structure of DNA, RNA, viruses, coal, graphite. She did a lot. And we also have on this list uh, Tung Yu Yu. Uh, she is a Chinese chemist who discovered the treatment for malaria. She was a Nobel Prize winner. So long story short, having role models in the STEM field that you are made aware of and that students can relate to increases the feeling of belonging in the STEM field, especially when um, so many scientists that are mentioned throughout STEM courses are mostly white men. So step three on forming an inclusive classroom is we have to take into account how students may have different motivations and aspirations for taking the specific STEM course. Not every single person in the classroom is just taking this specific STEM course because they want to major in it per se. Um, I personally teach um, intro to biology and these three categories, I know they're just pictures, but these three categories are what I've mainly observed from my students as to why they chose to take bio in the first place. Now, the vast majority are pre-med or pre-health in some degree, uh, and they take this class to fulfill a pre-med requirement. Now, because they have chose medicine as a career field, they're obviously interested in biology, but um, a motivate their main motivation for taking this biology class is because it is required um, for their pre-med track. Uh, as the second largest category of students are the ones that plan to go on to graduate school and who are also required to take this class as per um, their grad school and major requirements. Uh, they, just, they want to focus on biology research or something related to it, um, and that's why they're in that class. Now, the third category is small, uh, and most people don't do this, but I have encountered a couple of students who are just taking biology to fulfill their science credit. Uh, now, why they didn't choose an easier class, I am not sure, but uh, we have to keep into, we have to take into account that the way that we motivate uh, the pre-med and pre-graduate school students will not be the same way that, um, will not be the same way that we motivate these students that are just taking the class for a science credit. So now that we've taken into account the different motivations, we'll move on to how we motivate students. Um, now that we've covered three ways to make sure our, top, our classroom is more inclusive, I'm going to build on a topic mentioned in the last point, motivating factors. Now, how do we help students stay motivated and excited about the class content activities? Classes are semester long and they are a lot to digest. It is hard for students to stay motivated whenever there's just so much on their plate. So three ways that we can help them stay motivated is one, establish value. Two, build positive expectations. And three, address values and expectations. Let's move on to the first point. Motivational factors establishing value. First, we must connect material to student interests. I interpreted this as catering the content to the student's motivational factor. So 
if a student is pre-med and taking biology, a way that you might motivate a student to focus on a subject is maybe say, hey, this is likely going to be on the MCAT and stuff like that. Um, another way that we can motivate students is to connect material to real world current research. Now we do this in bio quite a bit. And I think it is very, very helpful for students to um, realize that, oh my gosh, this is how the conceptual stuff that I'm learning is being applied to treat disease and stuff like that. I think that makes the content in classes like biology a lot cooler. Number three, we can provide authentic real world tasks slash connections to the content. Now I'm in physics, which is another class that utilizes LAs, and we actually used this method um, to learn about Bernoulli's principle. In class, we took two sheets of paper and then blew in between them and watched how the ends of those paper closed together um, to help learn about Bernoulli's principle. Number four is um, show relevance to academic and professional lives. If we can give examples in a STEM course of how this specific topic is relevant to other classes or future standard, standardized exams, like the MCAT, the boards, et cetera, et cetera, to students, they will place more value on the content that they are learning. Additionally, um, their professional lives, their future professional lives, whether they be in medicine, graduate school, et cetera, et cetera, if we can tie that content and say, hey, this is something that you will be using on the daily basis, more value will be assigned and established to that content. So that is also very important. Number five, identify and reward what you as an instructor values. If you as an instructor values group work, place more grading emphasis on how well a group manages to work together and assign more group work. Um, or if you value creative thinking, make sure your assignments and exams uh, have questions that allow students to critically think or more creatively think uh, and reward them whenever uh, they demonstrate that they have obtained these skills that you want them to have. Number six, show enthusiasm for the subject as an instructor. I know from personal experience as a student that if an instructor is just monotone for the entire class, I will fall asleep. If you are up there and you are excited and thrilled about the content you are teaching, you will pass that good vibe on to your students. And hopefully they'll be excited with you. I know I'm very excited as a um, bio LA all the time. And I think, I like to think that that has motivated my students. Because if they see me smiling about learning about something, you know, smiles are contagious. I might pass it on. Our second motivational factor to focus on is building positive expectations. This entails ensuring alignment of objectives, instruction, and assessment. If your initial syllabus and your general what you tell the students to expect from the class does not match up with the exams or the assignments that they are given they get demotivated quite fast so it's important from the start to be very clear um, with what your students should expect um, number two identify an appropriate level of challenge biology is a freshman sophomore level class we cannot expect to give them senior bio major level questions and expect them to answer them well. Um, there has to be a balance, an appropriate level of challenge. And if there's not an appropriate level of challenge, then again, people get demotivated very quickly. They think, I'm, how can I even do this? How is this even possible? And they stop trying. Number three, early success opportunities. Whether this be extra credit or um, participation points, I think having something there that allows students to feel like their entire grade is not completely weighted on the on whether or not they do well on three or four very, very hard exams throughout the year also motivates them a little bit more. Um, early success opportunities also builds confidence in students because they feel like that they can actually take on the course. Number four, have assignments match the appropriate level of challenge. This kind of goes back into number one with ensuring the alignments of objectives. But if you have 
quiz questions or homework questions that are much, much easier than the exam, um, students feel hopeless. They don't know how they should study for exams. And again, lose motivation. Number five, articulate expectations, provide rubrics, all in all, be fair. I, I think this all falls under number one with just being very, very clear with your students, having a direct um, syllabus and a direct path that you want your students to go on uh, just sets a lot of students up for having more confidence and with more confidence comes more motivation. Number six is provide targeted feedback. And this is motivational because once you have targeted, um, concise and direct feedback, students feel like they know exactly what to fix and what to attack for the next examination or for future assignments. And so if your feedback is unclear, very vague, it is just overall unhelpful. Um, and students can feel hopeless in that, like, how am I even gonna pass this class? How am I even going to complete this class? Because they don't really know what they want from you. Number seven, educate students about wrongly defining success and failure. It's very important in every single STEM class, especially to encourage your students and assure them that your success in life is by no means numerical <laughs> at all. We should not wrongly define that. That's a, that's a definite pep talk that students need at the beginning of the year. And honestly, after every test. Finally, number eight, define effective study strategies for the course. It just goes along with the whole be upfront point with your students. If you tell your students exactly the effective study strategies that you have seen work for other students um, within the course, not only are you know, students more likely to take your advice and succeed, um, but also they feel like you're on their side, which of course you are. And if you are sharing with them this resource that you have, this advice, um, it builds even more positive expectations for the course. Finally, we are addressing values and expectations. Um, in this, includes providing flexibility and control and giving students an opportunity to reflect. Now, providing flexibility and control does not mean they could pick what time they would like to take the test or something like that. Um, providing flexibility and control means that uh, if you are giving them a writing prompt, you can give them multiple kinds of prompts or during an examination, uh, have three long response questions and they only have to answer two. Um, this flexibility gives students a sense of control, even though it's not complete control, it still gives them a sense of control, which is motivating because they don't feel as helpless. And the more in control you are, the more you feel like you know what you're doing. And that's motivating because when you feel like you're in control um, of yourself and you know what you're doing, you feel like there's a greater chance for success. Number two give students an opportunity to reflect. Now, again, I mentioned physics before, but I'm currently in physics. And after every single examination, we have to write a reflection essay. It's like one to two pages. And this is extremely important. I didn't realize how important it was, but giving students an opportunity to reflect on the content that they've learned, what they've struggled with, why they struggled with, what they learned, or why they think what they learned is important. All of those questions really help solidify um, the importance of the course content and it motivates you because it makes you realize the importance of the course content. And if you realize that this is important to really understand, then you are going to feel more motivated to study in the future. All right, and that's the end of the PowerPoint. All in all, by understanding how we can craft our classrooms to be an inclusive and safe learning environment for all students, and how we can motivate students to learn, we as instructors craft an ideal learning environment that facilitates the best academic growth for all students. Thank you.